In this video we will take a look at a systematic procedure for minimizing the number of states that are used in a finite state machine. Oftentimes when you start out designing a finite state machine, you uh, have too many states, and, uh, or some states which are redundant, and the procedure that we're looking at is uh, designed to eliminate those kind of redundant uh, states and minimize thereby the number of states of the finite state machine. A finite state machine with just a few states is relatively easy to design such that the number of states is minimized, but once um, a finite state machine becomes too complex or more complex, then um, it is not so obvious how to find the minimum number of states that are needed. The minimization of the number of states is of course of interest because this would uh, fewer states will reduce the cost and the complexity of a finite state machine. So if the number of states of a finite state machine can be reduced, then some of the original states must be equivalent to other states of the finite state machine. We can define state equivalence as follows. Two states, Si and Sj, are said to be equivalent if and only if, for every possible input sequence, the same output sequence will be produced regardless of whether Si or Sj is the initial state. Using this definition for state equivalence is not entirely practical. Uh, because it requires a lot of work in order to establish that state equivalence. So we will focus on a different minimization procedure that uses the idea of showing which states can definitely not be equivalent. So consider a finite state machine which has possible inputs w equal to 0, 1, 2, etc. up to n minus 1. If the finite state machine makes a transition from state Si to state Sj as a result of applying the input W equal to k, where k is in that set um, of numbers from 0 to n minus 1, then we say that state Sj is a k successor of state Si. So uh, state Sj um, is obtained or uh, is attained from state Si if the input W equal to K is applied. If the finite state machine has only one binary input, then K is either 0 or 1, and we have 0 successors and 1 successors. Okay, so from, for any given state, we then, in the binary case, either have to go to another state because W is equal to 0, or to another state because w is equal to 1. And the one that we go to when w is equal to 0, that's the zero successor of that particular state. And the one that we go to if w is equal to 1, that's the one successor of that particular state. From the definition of equivalent states, it follows that if two states, Su and Sv, are equivalent, then their corresponding k successors must also be equivalent for all values of k. Using this, we can formulate the minimization procedure that partitions the set of states of a finite state machine into subsets that can not possibly be equivalent. So for the partition minimization procedure, we define a partition as consisting of one or more blocks where each block is a subset of states that may be equivalent, but the states in a given block are definitely not equivalent to the states in other blocks. So our emphasis here is on showing when things are not equivalent and uh, if they will be if the states will be in the same block, then they may be equivalent, but we just know for sure that if they are in different blocks, then they cannot be equivalent. That's how we apply the partition procedure. So here is a summary of that state partition procedure. We start from the set of all states and call it partition P1. 
And then we form a partition P2, where all states that produce the same output go into the same block. And then we form new partitions uh, by testing whether the K successors of the states in each block are contained in one block. And those states whose K successors are in different blocks cannot be in the same block, so they will have to be partitioned um, into uh, subsets of the original block. And so in this way, new blocks are formed in each uh, new partition step. And then the partitioning process ends when the new partition is the same as the previous one. Then all states in each block are equivalent. It is possible that in the end, when the partitioning process ends, that each state is just in a block of its own. And in that case, we have been trying to minimize the number of states of a finite state machine that has already been minimized. So here's an example uh, of a more finite state machine. Okay, so we have a more FSM. And we assume that we have two, four, six, eight, nine states uh, initially, A, B, C, D up to I. And we assume just a binary input, so W is equal to zero or W is equal to one. And from state A, for example, we go to state I if W is equal to zero and to state C if W is equal to one. And if you are in state A, we produce an output of one. Similarly, for example, in state E, um, if w is equal to 0, then we go to state D. If w is equal to 1, then we stay in state E. And if we are in state E, then the output C is equal to 0. So the first partition that we get, P1, is equal to just all states A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and I. And then the next partition, we partition things depending on what C is. So when C is equal to 1, that goes into one block. So A, B, C, H, and I are in one block. So that's the first block here, which is underlined in blue. And then those output, those states which uh, make an output of 0, uh, which is D, E, F, and G, uh, they go into the other block, uh, which we underlined in green here. And then we have to form partition 3. And for that, we now take a look uh, at the states in each particular block, at what the 0 successors and the 1 successors are. So the upper one here is the 0 successor, or the 0 successors. And the lower ones are the 1 successors. And we can see that among the zero successors, I, B, C, H, and A, they are all in the same block, um, which is the, the blue block over here, so we underline those with blue. But the one successors, uh, the first two, they are also in the same block, and the last two are in the same block, but the one in the middle here, the G, that comes from the other block. And so we can see that among the states that we have here, a, B, and H, I, they may be equivalent states, but we know for sure that C here cannot be equivalent to A, B, H, or I, because it has a different one successor from the other one successors, or, or a different one, uh, a one successor that comes from a different block than the others. And then we do the same thing for the second block here, D, E, F, G. So we have the zero successors, um, here the upper ones, and the lower ones are the one successors. And we just obtain those from the table. So for example, for D, the zero successor is I, the one successor is C. So we have I and C in here. And then for E, the zero successor is D, and the one successor is E. So that's the D here and the E here and so forth. We again underlined um, those successors here depending on which block they belong to. And we can see that um, the first and the third, they come from the same block. 
whereas the second and the fourth, they come from different blocks. And so that means that D and F can be maybe equivalent, and G and H, uh, G and E may be equivalent, but for sure E and F cannot be equivalent, or D and G cannot be equivalent, and so forth. So we obtain now uh, partition P3, where the first part here, the A, B, and so on, we took out the C, because that could not be, uh, that we know cannot be in the same block as the others. So we put C into a separate block, but A, B, H, and I are left in that block. And then for the originally second block, the e, F, G, we, we saw that this has to be partitioned into two new blocks, D and F for one of them, and E and G for the other one. We use again colors to identify the different blocks so that we can easily see what needs to be done for the next partition step. So now we look at um, A, B, H, and I. It's actually up here. So A, B, H, and I, zero successors and one successors. The zero successors, they all come from the same block. So from that point of view, those states could still be equivalent. But then the one successors, they come from two different blocks, two of them from the C block and the other two from the A, B, H, I block. And so we know that we will have to partition again here. A and I may be equivalent, but they cannot be equivalent with B, H. And so we form here two new blocks in the next partition. Then we look at D and F, so coming from here. C we don't have to take a look at. We cannot partition C um, any further because there is only one element in that block. So D and F, the zero successes are I and I, and the one successes are C and C. So those for sure are going to be equivalent. So those stay in their block. And then E and G, we have um, both the one successes and the zero successes coming from two different blocks, from the one which we marked with dark green and the one with the light green. And so E and G, uh, cannot be equivalent, and they form individual uh, blocks here, as well as C, which already was an individual block. And then we do one more step, so now we're taking a look at those which are in pairs here. So AI, the zero successes are IA, which are in the same block, and the one successes are CC, which are in the same block. So we do not partition that any further. BH um, has zero successes in BH, so they are in the same block, and it has one successes in IA, which are in the same block. So BH does not need to be partitioned any further. And then DF, <coughs> the zero successes are II, one successes are CC, so there is no further uh, subdivision necessary here. And so we can see that we actually in going from partition 4 to partition 5, we did not change anything, and so at this point we can say that the procedure stops. And we now have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 states. So we were able to reduce this from 9 state to 6 states, and we have equivalent states A equal to I, B equal to H, and D equal to F, and we can make a new state table. And what we do here is we use the old state table. So for example, for A, we go back to the original state table, and we can see that this goes into I and C, with an output of 1. Now I is equivalent to A, and so we label this here instead of as I, we label it as A. Uh, C is one of the states that we are keeping, and the output is a 1. And then similarly, we would do this for B. B should actually look the same in that original table. So B goes to B and I, so, um, so it does actually not look the same, but I um, is the same as A. So B then goes into B and A depending on W, 
and the output is one and so forth. And so in this way we complete the table and whenever it says i in the original table we replace that by a. Whenever it says h in the original table we replace it by b and when it says f then we replace it by d. So the reduction of states from 9 to 6 is kind of nice because it means that we can implement such a finite state machine with uh, using just three flip-flops because um, uh, six states can be represented by just three bits whereas if we had nine states we would have to re represent by four flip-flops so that you know, gives us a reduction in the uh, in the cost uh, of the hardware that is needed here. Okay, and the minimization procedure that we used um, does actually ensure that the simplified finite state machine is functionally equivalent to the original one. And the definition of functionally equivalent is that two finite state machines are said to be functionally equivalent if they produce identical outputs for all possible input sequences. So it basically means if you uh, look at the finite state machine from the outside as a black box uh, and you feed inputs into it and observe outputs, you could not distinguish the more complex version from the minimized version if the two finite state machines are functionally equivalent.